Back. Yes. I was told that today is Rabbi Majeski's birthday. So it should be a shnas for the mohon. You're going to write him a poem? I'll leave that up to you. That's so sweet. Okay. Do we have anybody on the Zoom today? I don't think so. But talking she, to the Zoom. No, she, she said she wants to, to refer for to the Facebook to put on Facebook. Oh my. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Sure. If you that's the idea. Sages, they used to say a prayer when they went into the yeshiva. They would say a prayer to Hashem that they should teach according to the halacha and they shouldn't make a mistake. And when they left, they would say a prayer thanking Hashem that they were successful. So. <clears throat> Just to con conclude the story that we began yesterday about the Baal Shem Tov, uh, his father, Rabbi Eliezer, and his wife, Sarah, they knew now who Eliyahu and Avi was. They had, they had spoken with Eliyahu and received a blessing from Eliyahu and Avi. And they knew that he wasn't just a belligerent beggar, obnoxious in his behavior. But they had passed the test and they, were, they would be blessed with a child to call and to call him Yisro, which, the, which happened, that happened. So in their old age, like Avram and Sarah, that we read about in this week's parsha, they did have this child. And three years later, his father passed away, which we spoke about yesterday. So then, what happens? The little baby, the little child, is not a baby, he's a child, three years old, five years old, had to say Kaddish. And so his mother, Sarah, would wake him up very early in the morning and take him to Shul, her beloved child, that he should say Kaddish for his father. One day he comes into Shul, and there are two people learning in a little side room. Many Shuls had this little side room where people who came to Daven could sit and learn and meditate before they Daven. Some places it was called Chabatska room because people would learn Hasidus there. And there were two people learning that this little boy had not seen before, not, two of the, not the regular daveners there. And they're, they're learning Gomorra. They're learning in the Gomorra about in Brachus. And they're learning a passage in the Talmud where it asks a question, why? Is Kaddish said in Aramaic and not in Lashon HaKadosh? The little boy is very interested to hear this discussion. Because he's also saying Kaddish for his father. And the, the Talmud answers and says, because when a person says Kaddish, the angels hear this. And it's such a holy prayer Hashem doesn't want them to be jealous. Apparently they speak better Hebrew than Aramaic. <laughs> you don't understand the Aramaic. So you can have a question on that. 
But that's why, because it's such a very holy prayer. Then they turn to the little boy and they say, what's your name? And he says, the identity says his name is, uh, is, is Yisroel. Is, is your father, was your father Rebbe is Eliezer? He said, yes, he was. Oh, he said, he was a very special person. He was a great tzaddik. Now we have to go Daven. And they went down to Daven. Now this little interview had a tremendous impact on the child. Remember, who was this person that he never met before? This was, well, we'll soon find out. This was the same person who had come to tell Rabbi Eliezer that he was going to have a child. And he was checking up on him. And so that day, the Shoshana from Syracuse to Ramadan. So that day, when he said Kaddish, the little boy said Kaddish, he could feel, he could feel the angels crowding around to hear him saying these holy words were holier than they could understand. And he felt that he could see his father's face very, very close. Meanwhile, in the Vibrashul upstairs, his mother, Sarah, sees their former guest who had come to them with the prophecy and the blessing that they would have a child. And she knows who this is. And she wants to cry out to her son that you should know who's there in shul with you. Go speak to him. But she couldn't dare. She just hoped and hoped that they would meet. And so afterwards, after the davening, when she was taking him home, she asked him what happened in shul today. Did you see anything? Was there anything unusual? He said, yeah, there were two people in shul today I never met before. Oh, did you speak with them? She said, yes. They were learning in the, in the, little, in the little room. And, and what were they learning? Did you hear what they were learning? He said, yes, I did. And he told her what they were learning and what they said to him and how they gave him a bracha. And she was so happy. That's the story, okay? That's, the, that's where Hasidus comes from. Because that blessing that he got from Rabbi Eliezer, which was then ratified by Eliyahu Anovi, became the basis of his whole life long because the whole Torah is contained in that blessing. Because if you're not afraid of anybody except Hashem, that's the basis of all the negative commandments. And if you have such obvious role for every other Jew, that's the basis of all the positive commandments. And on these two pillars, of love of Hashem, well, a love of another Jew and love of Hashem, they go together like, you know, two, two hands like that. Like love and marriage. <laughs> you know the old song, love and marriage. Love and marriage, love and marriage. Go together like a horse and carriage. <laughs> So now you've got the whole thing. Now we have, but now we have to, you see, now we have to understand it. There's a story that there was a certain person, a non Jew. He had a lot of chutzpah. He came to Shammai, the great teacher, 2000 years ago, a colleague, fellow student of the great Hillel. And he said to him, Rebbe, teach me your whole Torah. I want to be Jewish. Teach me the whole Torah while I stand on one foot. What's it all about? He took a measuring <laughs> stick, a ruler, and he chased them away. That's your attitude. You don't deserve to learn. And then he went to Hillel. 
and asked him the same question. Hillel said in the negative, if you don't like something, don't do it to somebody else. That's what it's all about. Now go learn. You see, that's what it's all about. Now go learn. He didn't tell him the positive, love your fellow Jew like this, just like yourself. That's, that was too high level for someone that where he was holding. So you put in the negative. You don't like it, don't do it to somebody else. Now go and learn. That's the point that I want to bring out here is that now that we've got the basis of what Hasidism is all about, now go and learn. So we have to turn to page 44. The explanation of this whole subject of who's a Benini and who's a Tzadik and who's a Russia and what's the, the, the good and what's the bad and what's the good and what's the bad. How are we, we have five, five different categories. So to understand that, the Alter Rebbe, when he mentions somebody, he's not just giving you a reference, a, a footnote on the bottom of the page. The Alter Rebbe is taking us into the classroom, into the cheder, into the yeshiva, together with that person to hear what he's teaching us. So he has to take us now, he's going to take us now on page 44 to meet the great, tremendous tzaddik Rebbe Chaim Vital, Who was Rebbe Chaim Vital? Rebbe Chaim Vital was the foremost student of Rabbi Yitzchak Luria. So you have to know who is Rabbi Yitzchak Luria. And understand that, let's make a comparison also with the great tzaddik, the famous Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva teaches us the whole of the oral Torah. Without Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Akiva stood up single-handedly against the tremendous weight of the Roman Empire, which was determined to destroy Judaism. And he ensured that Judaism would survive. When all the sages were being killed off, Rabbi Akiva taught the whole of the old oral Torah gave it over to his select five select students. And they, and because of that, we, we know what the Torah is all about. Who gave us the written Torah? Moshe Rabbeinu. And the oral Torah is from Rabbi Akiva. So generations go by. Now we're now we're going to fast forward like 1500 years. And we come to a unique personality called Rabbi Yitzchok Luria. Sometimes very often they take the initials of a person's name and they give them like a nickname Rabbi Yitzchak, Gloria is called the Ari, who's a lion, Rabbi Yitzchak, the Ari. Zal means a blessed memory. The Arizal, like Rabbi, who we were met yesterday, or the day before, the Arizal did not live long. He lived, in fact, I think the same number of years as Rabbi. 39 years, that's all. <clears throat> but he was, he, he was tremendously deep and, and, and insightful. 
he grew up in Egypt. His mother was, who was orphaned, like the Baal Shem Tov, who was orphaned. His mother had family in Egypt. I think the family name was Ashkenazi. And she went down to where her family would uh, take care of her. And they lived in Egypt. And he was, he was very, very prodigious in his studies and in his, not just knowledge, but his understanding was very deep. And he, he was devoted in this, to the service of God in the most extraordinary way. He would do almost in isolation during the week and just come home during Shabbos. Anyway, at when he was like 38 years old, he received a directive from heaven to go to Israel. And he went to Tzvas where he joined a small group of brilliant scholars who were Mekubalim, mystics. And they were, the head of that group was Reb Moshe Cordovero, like from Cordoba. Um, someone who had left Spain at the time of the Inquisition. He was the head of the mystics and he joined their group shortly before Reb Moshe passed on and he became their, he became their leader. He was, the, he was outstanding amongst all of them. And even though there were great, great, tremendous scholars in that group, and he was younger than they were, but he was far greater than they were. Now, I don't know much about him, but I do know this story that they asked him, how is it possible that in your group of um, friends, your colleagues, there are such great people and yet you surpass them. And he said, because any mitzvah that ever came to my hands, I did it with a complete and total involvement and happiness, joy. Because of that, he merited to understand the godliness in everything so much more deeply than, and than others. Okay? He what became the teacher and leader of this small group of mystics in Sfas in the, in the 1500s. Whatever he taught was not written down. He didn't allow anybody to write it down. But he had one uh, student who came to him from Iraq, from Babel, Babylon, named Rabbi Chaim Vital. And Rabbi Chaim Vital was the only one allowed to write down the teachings of the Arizal. It was revealed. You know, we said yesterday, the Torah is eternal. We, are li we live through, the Torah is the stories of what happened thousands of years ago. It's our story. The Alter Rebbe, it says in the, the, the daily journal of the, uh, that, the, uh, that the Our Rebbe put together, called Hayoim Yoim, he quotes there from the Alter Rebbe that we have to live with the Parsha of the week. What does that mean? That means that the Parsha of the week is telling us about our own life. And it's logical to say that because we know for a fact that the creation isn't an altazach, it's not an old thing from thousands of years ago that's sort of you know carrying on on, on automatic pilot. It's constantly being recreated. The world is constantly being recreated out of nothing. And how does Hashem create the world? It says in the Medrash. The very first medrash uh, about the creation of the world on the first pasuk of the whole Chumash, 
It says, just like an architect builds a building, he has his plans, he looks into the plans and he follows what's written in the plan in order to build the building straight. My brother, Oliver Shalom, built an addition to his house. The contractor didn't follow the plans. He put a window in the wall and it didn't fit where it was supposed to go. They had to bring, tear down the wall and build a new wall. A contractor, a builder has to follow the plan. Hashem also is like an architect. First, he made the plans for the world. Where did he write them down? In the Torah. What was the Torah before the world was given? It says black fire, not letters of black ink, black fire. You light a candle, you see the bottom, it's dark. Black fire and white fire. Which is hotter? White fire. So on the, the Torah, the white parchment is as important as the letters. Even higher. And every letter in the Torah has to be surrounded by white. And if two letters touch and they're not surrounded, the whole Torah is no good. You can't read from it. So, so the Torah existed before the world existed. Hashem looked in the Torah. That was the blueprint for creation. And he built the world according to the directions. So if you want to understand how a building is, I studied architecture once in my career, and we studied blueprints. We had to understand how buildings were constructed. To understand the history of architecture, we had to learn all about how buildings are built and what goes into building buildings. So if we want to understand our life, we have to, have to understand that we have to learn Torah. Because Torah is the, the active blueprint by which the world is being created right now. I saw an interesting thing just two days ago. My grandchildren were leaving and my daughter bought for her child a toy to entertain him on the plane. What was the toy? I don't know if I'll be able to draw it. It was like this. You could, he could blow in here and it was like a cradle here. I'm not drawing it really accurately, but there was like a cradle here with a little ball, very light ball. And when he blew into this pipe, so to speak, a little ball, went up into the air. <laughs> and as long as he kept blowing, he could blow the ball up in the air. And if he stopped blowing, it would fall back into its place. Well, that's exactly how the world is being created every single second. If Hashem is going to stop blowing for a second, the world's going to go out of existence. You understand? So since Hashem is creating the world the whole time, and he's doing it according to the blueprint, which is the Torah. <clears throat> so if we connect ourselves to the Torah so strongly, then we're, we're, we're getting at the very secrets of creation. And since uh, Rabbi Yitzchok was on that level, so he merited to have a deeper understanding, even in the great scholars who were his colleagues. But he didn't allow anybody to write down his teachings, except for one student who was on a level to be able to do that. And how did he choose that student? That's a mystery. He knew by divine inspiration that the student who would be able to, to receive his teachings and give them over lived in Babylon, in Bubble. And he had to get him to come to Tzvas because otherwise he couldn't transmit the teachings that he had achieved on his own and had received from his teachers who especially was Rabbi Moshe Cordovero of Cordova. And we'll see his name more often too, because the Altareb is going to teach us 
but introduce us to him as well. So who was this person? This person was Rabbi Chaim Vital. Was his name? And he was the only one who wrote down the teachings of the Arizal. And from him, we have everything that we know about Jewish mysticism today. This is the basis from which Chabad Hasidus derives. And the tradition is, you know, girls, your neshama, your life, the essence of who you are is here in order to connect. Remember the first thing we learned? Three things. You and Hashem in the world. We have to connect all these three things together. That means there's a relationship between them. Your spiritual makeup is a reflection of the design of the Torah. It's an, 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 an image. One is an image of the other. As Hashem looked in the Torah, that's how he made everything. And he created man in the divine image. Where's the divine image? The divine image is in Torah. That's Hashem's image, which he imprinted in the Torah. Just like every artist tells his own story. Sometimes I've seen quotes like this that an artist says, I only have one story to tell. Or critics say, he only has one story. He keeps on telling the same story over and over. There was once a person, it's recorded, Herbert Wiener, a very interesting book, I think called Nine Mystics. He was a real former rabbi. And he went around interviewing great Jewish leaders, mystics, who were, who were mystical people. And one of them was the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And he came to a Farbreng and he understood Yiddish. He heard the Farbreng Rebbe Farbreng and he came to the Rebbe and he said to the Rebbe, he complained. He said, you know, I heard your Farbreng and you seem to be saying the same thing over and over again. And the Rebbe smiled and he said, I only have one thing to say. <laughs> we also only have one thing to say. It's called the Shema. Now we know that we have to go and learn. Okay, so the Arizal, so 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 the Torah being a blueprint of our life and of the world's life is eternal, and the things we read in the Torah have to be always with us. So there has to be Moshe Rabbeinu. It wasn't just for thirty three hundred years ago. It has to be Moshe Rabbeinu in every generation. The, and, and, and our neshama also has to connect. Our neshama's goal is to connect with its source in the Torah and to connect everything that's connected, to, that, that is part of our portion in this physical world. We have to discover that. We have to be explorers. In grade five, I learned about the explorers. Marco Polo and Vasco da Gama, and Magellan. It was, oh, so exciting to read about these people. Well, we are also explorers. We're spiritual explorers. We're discovering new lands all the time. Only they're not called lands. They're called sparks of holiness. And we have to, they're, they're just like... <clears throat> There were places that each of these uh, explorers could dis were destined to discover. There are places in the world that we are destined to discover and to return them to their source in godliness. And these sparks are connected to our neshama. And sometimes we have to, Hashem puts us through all kinds of tricks and, and trials and, and, and journeys to find these sparks that are our destiny. There was a Jewish playwright 
not a religious man, named Henry Miller. And he understood this like intuitively. And in one of his most famous plays, he wrote about a person who was an anti-hero, called him low man. And he was, he was a failure in the world of economics, in the world that's dominated by acquisition and wealth and materialism, he was a failure. And that tormented him. And he had an uncle Ben, we, will, we could study in mysticism, what does Ben stand for? He had an uncle Ben who was very wealthy and he keeps on saying over and over again, uncle Ben, went down into darkest Egypt and by gosh, he came out rich. And, and that seemed always to, to embody, as so far as I can see this myth or this uh, archetype of the explorer, the spiritual explorer who goes into the darkness of Olam Hazab, this physical world, and he comes out rich with what? With sparks of holiness. He discovers there in deepest, darkest, Oilam Hazen. Okay. So this is the idea that the Torah is eternal. So therefore, in every generation, there's not just Moshe Rabbeinu from 3,000 years ago. In every generation, there has to be a Moshe Rabbeinu. Who's the Moshe Rabbeinu of the generation. And I will, I'm going to tell you that that was the Arizal in his time. He was the reincarnation of Moshe Rabbeinu. And all of us, our neshamas, are reincarnations. And the neshama keeps on coming back in order to fulfill all of the mitzvahs of the Torah, to connect itself with its own source of life in the Torah and to connect all of the sparks that are in this world waiting for us to discover them and elevate them. So you have to know wherever you go, you're on an adventure because you don't know what you're gonna discover or why you're going there. But there are sparks there waiting for you. They've been waiting maybe for thousands of years for you to come along and say a bracha. And elevate that spark of holiness. There's a story I'm not going to tell you now, but the, the bottom line of the story is that a, a person's grandfather was reincarnated in a drink in vodka. The Mashem Tov saved his grandson from just throwing back the drink without saying a bracha. That's an interesting story. But that's the point, you see, that, that our neshama comes back again and again and again in order to fulfill its purpose in the world of connecting the world with Hashem. Three things, that first remember three things, never come to sin. So if the Moshe Rabbeinu was the Arizal, who was Rabbi Chaim Vital? Rabbi Chaim Vital was the reincarnation of Rabbi Akiva. That's what I was taught. It's written in books, in holy books. The custom amongst great sages is that when they write a book, they put themselves in the book. Like Hashem wrote a book called the Torah, he put himself into the Torah. When you read a good book, you're reading the author. You're reading his soul. Hashem put himself completely, heart and soul into the Torah. So therefore authors very often name their books with their own name. So what great book do we have from their result? Nothing, we don't have any books from him. We're gonna eliminate this.
probably some agency telling me that the expiration on my car is I haven't had a car for eight years. I haven't had a car for 25 years, so it's funny when they call me. And they call you and tell you it's expired. The insurance is expired. First of all, I'm too blind to drive. So what car? <laughs> so anyway, so the great books that we have from Rabbi Chaim Vital, which are the basis of the teachings of the Arizo, have his name in them, and they are called the Eitz Chaim. Who knows what that means? Eitz Chaim. Huh? Eitz is a tree. Tree of life. A tree of life. So we know that in the garden there were two trees. It was a tree of life and the tree of knowledge. The Torah is called the tree of life. The Torah is called Eitz Chaim. When we raise the Torah up in Shul, we say Eitz Chaim. He. It's a tree of life for those who take hold on it. And this is the book that Reb Chaim wrote down, the teachings of the Arizal in this book. And he wrote a second book called The pre Eitz Chaim. What does the word pre mean in Hebrew? <laughs> you Hebrew speakers? What does the word pre mean? Pre is fruit. For a pre, ha eats. For a pre, adama. The fruit of the earth, tree, the fruit of the earth. So this is the book of the tree of life and the fruit of the tree of life. These are the books in which we have the teachings of the Arizal. And uh, now let's learn a line inside. So much for story time. Okay, page 44 now. Be or in, in order to understand all these questions that we have from page one, we have to refer to the teachings of Rabbi Chaim Vital. And in his book, there's the gate of holiness, Shar HaKadusha. And in the eighth Chaim, which is the tree of life, in the 50th gate, chapter two. Now, these numbers are not just page references. They're all mystically significant because everything that such authors of this sort put together is significant. So every page that something's found upon is not an accident. There's no... There's no accidents in Hashem's creation, which is constantly taking place. Hashem doesn't make accidents. Okay. And what does he say there? What do we have to learn from the Arizal through Rebbe Chaim Vital? Are you ready? Fasten your seatbelts. The Lakol Ish Yisroel. Every single Jewish person. Anybody here feel part of that group? Yes, me. Usually. Echad Tzadik, whether he's a Tzadik. Echad Rasha, or if he's not a Tzadik. We are inclusive, not exclusive. We are inclusive. Yesh, Shtein, Shames. You have two souls. We don't have two gods. We have one God, but we have two souls. How can that be? Stay tuned. We'll get there tomorrow. Leaving us on a cliffhanger. What? I said leaving us on a cliffhanger. <laughs> well, don't fall off. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Shachov. Okay, now's your chance to ask questions. Yes, uh, Rebetzin Devorah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you said uh, that uh, Arizal yes. arrived in Sfat when he was 38 years old and he died. A year and a half later. A year and a half later. So that was the time enough to... to and and high uh, and high in the there's one there's arrived. a story 
that one time the Arizal was resting, had a nap, he was sleeping, and his student came in and he woke up and he said to him, Rebbe, were you dreaming? He says, yes. What did you dream about? He said, it would take me 80 years to tell you what I dreamed about. It was so high to bring it down, all those levels would take 80 years. Is there a reason he died so so young? There is a well a known reason. He had accomplished what he had to. His mission was fulfilled. <laughs> as every, Same thing as Rabba. As everybody. Yeah. Rabba also only lived that same period of time. Rabba from page one of the Tanya, who said he's a Bainani. No, Rabba, 2,000 years ago, taught that there are five categories of Jewish souls Sadiqim, Rashayim, Bainanim. Sadiqim who have good, Sadiqim who don't have good, Rashaim who have good, Rashaim who have bad. And then the average guy and Rabbah said, like me, I'm a Bainani. And his colleague Abaya said, it can't be this, you can't say such a thing. If you're a Bainani, we're all dead. We didn't leave room for anybody to live. That's Rabbah. Rabbah is, you want to understand who Rabbah is? Think of the Rebbe. Could the Rebbe be a Bainani? In your mind, could the Rebbe be an average man? Not from our point of view. From his point of view, maybe he thought he was an average person. He thought his father-in-law was a tzaddik. To him, his father-in-law was like Rabbo. And he was a disciple. But then he had to carry on. The Rebbe often re sometimes referred to himself as a, a midget, but a midget on the shoulders of a giant can be higher than the giant. I saw a hand. Were all of the Rebbe's about status? Yes. Yes. Each one was the successor of the one before him, a successor by definition fills the position of the one before. So in the Rebbe, you have all the Rebbeim under his hat. Who came after Arizal on the teaching of those scholars that Chaim Vital. Chaim Vital. Okay, I didn't take attendance. Shoshana, please take attendance. Okay. Okay, I have to remember to say a brach achreina. I'll say that downstairs. Thank you so much.